Thank you for joining this webinar hosted by the University of Florida Honeybee Research and Extension Lab. My name is Mary Bammer. I am the Extension Coordinator for the UF Honeybee Lab, and I will be the host for today's webinar, which is titled Prescription Antibiotic Use for Honeybees. Today we will hear from three speakers, Dr. Michael Murphy from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, Mr. David Westervelt from Apiary, Apiary Inspection at the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, and Dr. Jamie Ellis from the University of Florida Honeybee Research and Extension Lab. Topics covered today include a summary of the FDA ruling that's bringing beekeepers and veterinarians together, an overview of the history and prevalence of relevant honeybee diseases in Florida, and a look at how to identify the signs of these diseases in honeybee colonies. We will begin by hearing from Dr. Michael Murphy, who is a part of the U.S. FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine. So uh, my take home message is uh, beginning on January 1st of this year, use of medically important antimicrobials requires an order from a licensed veterinarian to authorize the use of those medically important antimicrobials. For honeybees, um, the medically important antimicrobials that would be of most uh, interest to you, I believe, would be oxytetracycline, tylosin, and lincomycin. So first I want to touch on some changes that have occurred in, in the last few uh, months. Uh, first is medically important means an antimicrobial that's important in human medicine. The, although humidillin is an antimicrobial, it's not medically important and is not impacted by this action. Uh, the marketing status of the medically important antimicrobials transition from over-the-counter status where you could receive them without uh, veterinary oversight to now where an order is needed from a licensed veterinarian to authorize their use. So you will, uh, if you have not already seen, you will begin to see on these products, if it's regulated as a, what we call a medicated feed, then you will see on the label of that product the statement here, federal law restricts medicated feed containing this veterinary feed directive drug to use by or on the order of a licensed veterinarian. Uh, other products uh, transition from over-the-counter to prescription status, and so you'll see the, the legend regarding prescription that you've seen for some time. So those orders will be a veterinary feed directive order if it's for medicated feed, or a prescription if it's for those in prescription uh, status. And I will uh, just want to touch on that the, the veterinarians will have some uh, limits on their ability to write these uh, orders. First, the veterinarian needs to be licensed to practice veterinary medicine and then practicing uh, veterinary medicine with on all the applicable uh, regulations that pertain to veterinarians in the state in which they're practicing. And this includes something that's referred to as a veterinarian client patient relationship, which we can get back to in the question period if we need to. Uh, additional limits on the authorization have to do with the extra label use of products. And extra label use is not permitted uh, for uh, the use of drugs in or on an animal feed. And I'll touch on the uh, significance of that in a slide or two. Uh, and extra label use is not permitted if a residue uh, results. And although they're not common, we are aware of some antibiotic residues that have been uh, detected in honey products. So now I'll turn to the, the part of the slides that are of most direct interest to you. Um, oxytetracycline is uh, a medically important antimicrobial that transitioned from over the counter to what we call veterinary feed directive uh, marketing status. Uh, its approval was published in a part of the code of federal regulations that I have uh, listed here on the slide. And then there are three specific applications, the application numbers for which I have listed on the left here. And I'm gonna give you the general overview of all three of those applications, but encourage you to uh, look up the specifics of each one at the information that I'll provide at the end of the talk on supplemental inf information. So the active ingredient is oxytetracycline. It's for control of American and European uh, fowl brood. 
the amount is 200 milligrams per colony and for residue purposes we ask that you remove the uh, oxytetracycline from the colony at least six weeks prior to the main honey flow. Uh, we've had questions about where folks might be able to get the VFB medicated feed products and we have posted on our uh, the Center for Vet Medicine website a list of each of the folks who have notified us of their intent to distribute VFD medicated feed. There are some um, almost 10,000 uh, folks that have done that and it's sorted by state on our website so that might be uh, one place you could go look. With respect to medicated feed, uh, a reminder that extra label use of drugs and medicated feed is prohibited. Um, we do have a compliance policy guide for minor species, which would include bees, and we can uh, discuss that more uh, if there are questions on it. So now I'm going to turn to those products that were approved or that transitioned from over-the-counter to prescription marketing status. They have a slightly different uh, legal category. This will also include some oxytetracycline products, but also tylosin and lincomycin. And as before, I have where it's published in the Code of Federal Regulations and the specific um, new animal drug uh, application or abbreviated new animal drug application numbers that you can use to get more details on the specific uh, product. Uh, generally speaking, the active ingredient is oxytetracycline. Here it's control of American fowl brood. These don't have European on the label. Uh, the amount is 200 milligrams per colony. Uh, in a sugar syrup or a dusting with uh, powdered sugar mixture. And again, it has the uh, uh, limitation to remove six weeks prior to honey flow. For the Tylus and tartrate products, um, uh, also control of American fowl brood, also 200 milligrams uh, in tw 20 grams of um, confectioners or powdered sugar. Um, to apply to the brood chamber once weekly for three weeks. And then here, uh, there, the, uh, the label recommendation or limitation is to complete the treatments four weeks prior to main honey flow. And then the last product is lincomycin. There's one approved application for that. Uh, also control of American fowl brood. Here it's, 10, it's 100 milligrams uh, per colony, uh, also dusting once weekly for three weeks. And uh, here it's also four weeks uh, prior to main honey flow. With those, the ones that have transitioned to prescription marketing status, they fall in a, a slightly different legal category than the veterinary feed directive ones. So there are provisions that may allow extra label drug use of these products and the veterinarians will be familiar with this uh, from AMDUCA and our um, extra label drug use regulations in the Code of Federal Regulations Part uh, 530. So some sources of information to look up the details of particular approved applications. There's uh, animal drugs at FDA and there's a link to that website here. For the veterinary feed directive, the octatextracycline approved products, we have what are called bluebird labels that uh, are um, what you would see on the label of the product. Uh, those can be available at our bluebird label website. If you're looking at the Code of Federal Regulations, there's a link to it at the electronic version, which is uh, updated almost uh, immediately as things occur here. And again, those list of distributors that are sorted by state that you might find uh, of interest. Uh, OMOMS stands for our Office of Minor Use and Minor Species, and that's a link to our, uh, to that office uh, within the Center for Veterinary Medicine, and uh, honeybees certainly fit as a minor species in that regulatory apparatus. Uh, those of you that might have questions, we invite you to send them in to ask CVM at this, at FDA period, HHS period, gov. I'm anticipating one of the questions that you might ask of where can I find a veterinarian in my state that uh, is interested in beekeepers. Uh, although this is not an FDA website, uh, I am, uh, this bvets.com is one 
place where uh, folks are fostering that um, availability. So uh, I want to end with uh, the way I began. As of January 1st, the use of medically important antimicrobials will require an order from a licensed veterinarian uh, for, for um, beekeepers. This is probably uh, most impactful for oxytetracycline, tylosin, and leukomycin. And with that, I will uh, turn it over to our next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. Our next speaker is Mr. David Westervelt. David is the Chief Apiary Inspector for the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Apiary Inspection is the group responsible for regulation of European honeybee colonies in the state. Y'all have to bear with me. I spent three days at the state fair, so I sound like a frog, sort of. All right, so actually uh, I'm in charge of the whole state for apiary inspection. We're the regulatory part on American fowl brood. And American fowl brood, the history on American fowl brood, it's actually been here in the U.S. and around the world roughly for about 2,000 years. It's actually an old disease that we've been putting up with. It's not something that's going to go away. And uh, it's been mentioned for a, a long time. Uh, beekeepers have had many a treatments for it, but with the new uh, bee directive, they're running scared, if I could say anything right now, because they're worried that it's going to go uh, rampant like it was back in the early 1900s. Uh, both of the uh, American and European, the recognition of it, uh, for at least for the inspectors, what we do in the field, we would do a probe test to allow for the stringing of the organism or the larva as they're in the field. Uh, there's a couple different ways that we would do that. Also, checking for the pseudo tongue. And also for European, we look for a larva that is curled in the cell. So they're both uh, American is the only one we really worry a lot about in Florida. Uh, and to control it, we actually use uh, the antibiotics, the three that have been listed. Uh, the best way for beekeepers actually to reduce the possibility is removing the reservoirs and doing sanitation of the old equipment and uh, swarms and feral hives that would be around them. Also, spring management is something we definitely tell beekeepers to use, getting rid of their old combs which would be also a reservoir of it. Uh, like Michael mentioned er earlier on antibiotics, uh, there are the three that are open for use. Uh, teramycin for the last roughly 40 years has been used. We do see some American fowl brood resistant to teramycin. Uh, that's why we've gone to the tylosin and now the newest one is lincomycin. Uh, I'm not going to go on to the main. And actually, teramycin is a broad spectrum uh, antibiotic used for both European and American. Uh, the one thing you want to make sure of when the beekeepers are using it, to use it in a fairly fast uh, manner. Don't leave it for more than 24 hours. Uh, a little goes a long way. So, lincomycin, like I said, is a newer product that the beekeepers, I only know of a few beekeepers that have actually used it, but uh, it is a newer one. It's also a soluble powder, narrow spectrum. So, Thailand, same way. And we've always been told on the Thailand, it's one that is persistent in that uh, it continues to work. We have not seen any resistance to it as far. So 
it's also a little goes a huge way on it. So our regulations on American foul brood, our Florida statute is actually what covers and allows us to regulate honeybees and we certify honey and honeybees throughout the state. Uh, our inspection program, when the beekeepers are registered here, we inspect commercial beekeepers on an annual basis allows them to move throughout the country on our certificate. Uh, American Fowl Brood is, if we find American active during our inspection, we destroy it. Uh, it would be uh, one of the only things we destroy the hive for. Under the Florida Administrative Code, that's actually what gives us the power to go into the beehives and do everything. Uh, American foul brood is listed as an actual pest. Uh, it's a disease that's uh, persistent and we don't want beekeepers transferring it through. We do allow beekeepers to treat, not to treat once we find it, but they have the right to treat their own operations as long as they're following the label. Uh, the only other thing we do uh, on irradiation the state does allow for radiation if the beekeeper does it under a certificate. Uh, we actually inspect and follow through on that whole uh, irradiation when they take it down to the chamber. We only have one place left in Florida. It's down by Palmetto that is allowed to do it. It's uh, really not cost prohibitive, but we do cover that. So, uh, and it's what can we do as beekeepers, comb replacement? Uh, those are mainly what we need to talk with our beekeepers about uh, in hive inspections. So, the main thing that we always talk about is if the beekeeper is using antibiotics and they actually find hives that are breaking down with the disease. Uh, they definitely need to destroy it and uh, not to wait around and play with it. So both of the, or all three of the antibiotics that we have been using uh, do a perfect job of controlling it right now. So the only cure, as we always say, is burning it. We've yet to find American that got resistant to burning. So with that, I think it's Jamie's turn. Thanks, David. Our last presenter is Dr. Jamie Ellis, an associate professor in the entomology and nematology department at the University of Florida and the head of the UF Honeybee Research and Extension Lab. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jamie Ellis, and I do work for the University of Florida. I'm going to give you a little overview of the biology of American fowl brood and the signs of disease that it produces in our colony so you can kind of understand what it is beekeepers are facing as they try to address this issue. Before I do that though, I think it might be helpful for you guys to understand a little bit of the terminology I'll be using as we discuss fowl brood. So what you see on this image are the three types of honeybees that occur in a honeybee colony. In the upper left, it's the queen. In the center, it's a drone or the male honeybee. And the bottom right is the worker honeybee. Now you'll notice the words American fowl brood have the word brood in it. So what you're looking at on this slide, you're looking at adult bees. So adult bees do not suffer uh, symptomatically from American fowl brood. Instead, it's the immature stages of bees that suffer. The immature stages of honeybees collectively are uh, referred to as brood, and that includes the honeybee egg, the image in the upper left. Out of that egg will emerge young larvae, which are worm-like creatures, and they sit in the back of their cells and are fed food provided to them by their adult sister. And it's that food that can become contaminated with the American fowl brood bacterium. And as those young larvae eat that food, they're becoming inoculated with the pathogen. 
Once those larvae have finished eating, they will stand up in their cells and the worker bees, the adult worker bees, will cap over those cells with a thin layer of wax like you see in the bottom right corner of the picture that's in the bottom right. And in that stage is the stage that the immature bees will actually die due to infection from American fowl brood. If they were to survive and not be infected, they would begin to pupate, which means their bodies begin to look like adult bees. And then for worker bees, 21 days later, they will emerge as an adult. So collectively, that egg in the upper left and the larvae in the upper right and the prepupa in the lower right and the pupa in the lower left, those four images represent what we call the brood in the honeybee colony. On this next slide, we're, I'm showing you what we refer to as a brood pattern. If you remember back on the previous slide, when the larvae have finished eating, the adult sisters, their adult sister workers, will cap over those cells with a thin layer of wax. So the pupal stage occurs under the capped cell. So if you look in the image in the upper left, all of those little brown circles are covering over the cells under the cappings which pupae are developing. And we, one of the signs of disease associated with American fowl brood is it will take that solid looking pattern that you see on the upper left and it will become a very spotty pattern like you see in the lower center picture. And a spotty brood pattern simply means that there are many empty cells interspersed or dispersed through the cells that actually have developing bees in them. So healthy colonies typically have uh, brood patterns that are like what you see in the upper left, and diseased colonies have brood patterns like what you see in the bottom center image. As the other speakers have noted, there are two types of bacterial diseases that uh, impact the immature honeybees, and both of those are called foul brood. Both of these diseases cause the immature stages to die and rot and therefore produce a smell. There are two types. There are European foul brood and American foul brood. We've discussed these already. But the key is, is that American and European foul brood bacteria infect larvae that are younger than about 48 hours old. But European foul brood kills the larvae, whereas American foul brood kills the prepupae and pupae. So as a result of that, European foul brood manifest in open cells, like what you see in the picture in the upper left, where the larvae themselves are showing signs of disease because they're twisted or yellow or brown in color, while American foul brood manifest in capped cells because that's the stage of brood that it kills. So we're going to focus in specifically on American fowl brood and I'd like to share with you some signs of disease that beekeepers as well as state bee inspectors are looking for when they're trying to figure out what it is their bees have. So on this next slide you'll see um, some schematics of larvae. The very first larva, the one on the left, is eating food that has the American fowl brood spores in it. And as a result, it's going to become diseased. And when its cell is capped over, it will die in that stage and have enough spores in it to infect the rest of the colony. One point that I'd like to make that is a key difference between European and American fowl broods is that European fowl brood is a bacteria that does not form spores. As a result of that, if the colony has European fowl brood, you can treat for it with an antibiotic and the fowl brood, the vegetative state of the uh, bacteria dies and you actually rid the colony of European fowl brood. So you can treat after the fact with European fowl brood to, to cure the disease. On the other hand, American fowl brood has um, a spore stage of development, which simply means when you treat the colony with an antibiotic, you're only killing the vegetative stage of the fowl brood, and what you're leaving behind is the spore that can reactivate months or years later. In fact, they've shown the spores can survive for decades 
in otherwise um, healthy looking colonies or for decades on beekeeping equipment. And it's that spore that makes this American fowl brood so difficult to control. Once that cell is capped over, the prepupa that's in it, like what you see on the upper left, will start to show signs of disease. It will turn from pearly white to a brown color and it will start to, to die and melt in that cell and, and fall to the bottom of that cell. And it forms what is effectively a scale on the bottom of that cell, which is the image you see in the bottom right. And that's the stage that this uh, disease manifests as a smell in the colonies. Keeping in mind that this is a capped brood disease, in the picture on the left, one of the things that you'll notice is that two of those cells have a wax capping over the top. One of those cappings, the cappings on the bottom, is sunken, which is a sign of the disease, and the other capping, which is in the top, has perforations in it, which is an additional sign of the disease. If you look in the image on the right, you can see in the bottom of some of those cells the scales that are forming as a result of the dead prepupae that have died and shriveled to the bottom of those cells. So for example, about half of those cells in the image on the right, you can see these hardened scales that contain millions upon millions of American fowl brood spores that can go on to infect other larvae in this colony and potentially other colonies. On this next slide, I'm showing you some other signs of disease that David has shared with you. When you see suspect cells, cells that have sunken cappings or preparations in the cappings, you can take a small stick and stick it into that um, suspect cell and stir it around and slowly withdraw that stick and if the contents of that cell rope out with the stick, it's a, it's a fairly reasonable indicator that you have American fowl brood. And so you can see that uh, in the picture on the left where a matchstick has been stuck into that cell, stirred around and withdrawn, and the contents of that cell are roping out with it. Unfortunately, that's not really a diagnostic sign of the disease. Many of these signs of disease that I've discussed with you so far manifest with some of the other brood diseases that our colonies get. So you're not really just looking for those things. It's this collection of signs of disease that you're looking for that suggests that it's American fowl brood. In the image on the upper right, once that prepupae has died and begins to melt to the bottom of the cell, occasionally you will get what we call the pupil tongue, which is that small uh, um, rope-like structure sticking from the dying bee up to the roof of that cell. And you can see it in the image in the upper right and the image in the bottom right. That particular sign of disease is actually um, diagnostic. Uh, there are no other honeybee pathogens that create that sign of disease in the, in the colony. With that said, it is also not a particularly common sign of disease. So you can have American fowl brood manifest in the colony without that pupil tongue occurring as well. Because American fowl brood forms spores and you can't easily see them, it is very easy to move it from colony to colony to colony, especially when colonies aren't manifesting the signs of disease. And that can happen through just typical management practices. You know, beekeepers wear gloves, for example, to keep their hands from being stung, like you see in the image in the upper left. And as they go from colony to colony to colony, they can transfer the spores between colonies and infect subsequent colonies. In the image in the upper right, you see jars of liquid on top of those colonies. Well, those um, can be um, in, infected with American fowl brood spores that can be transferred to colonies as you're feeding colonies. In the image in the lower left, it's a very common practice for beekeepers to move frames of honey between colonies to um, equal out the food stores that are in colonies, and the spores can be transmitted this way. We even suspect that spores can be transmitted as infected bees forage on flowers and leave those spore contaminants on the flowers as subsequent bees come and visit those flowers like you see in the image in the bottom right. 
as I've shared earlier, there are signs of disease that you can look for in colonies, but unfortunately most of them are not diagnostic, meaning that they're not unique to American fowl brood. You can see a lot of these together, which suggests that it's American fowl brood, but ultimately there are other ways that you have to confirm the disease's presence. They make test kits like the test kit you see in the upper left. It's a lot like a pregnancy test kit. You collect a few suspect uh, prepupae, you smush them up in a small vial, you put a, a drop of that um, liquid onto this test kit and two lines equal positive, one line equals negative. You can buy these from many uh, beekeeping equipment manufacturing companies. These particular spores also exhibit brownying movement under the microscope. If you're familiar with that, that simply means the spores when viewed under a microscope are shaking vigorously. That is not unique to American fowl brood. Other bacteria will do that as well. But when you suspect you have American fowl brood, you can specifically look for that under a microscope and that can help you um, believe that you might have uh, the disease. There is an open access review article called Standard Methods for American Fowl Brood Research published by the Journal of Apicultural Research. And I note that it's open access, which means that you can Google that particular phrase and search uh, Journal of Apicultural Research and you can get this article and download it. And it shows uh, the, the global standards for actually diagnostic, diagnosing the disease if, if you ever wanted to do that with absolute certainty. The only way to do it with certainty is to use PCR or other molecular techniques. Uh, but collectively, these signs of disease and some of these things like browning movement are strong indicators that your colonies are suffering from this issue. As the two other distinguished speakers have already noted, there are a couple of antibiotics available to beekeepers to treat this. And I will tell you that it is a common, uh, really uh, nationwide recommendation. Most of my colleagues in other universities and other states make a pretty blanket recommendation that you treat prophylactically for American fowl brood, i.e. you treat before you have the problem. And the general recommendation is to treat in spring and fall as the labels permit. So some labels may only permit one treatment a year. Some, um, as some of the other speakers have noted, suggest that uh, or note that the, the treatment has to be made at least six weeks prior to honey flow. So in essence, we always recommend that you follow the label regardless of whether you're using uh, teramycin or Thailand or lincomycin, but the general recommendation is to treat twice a year prophylactically in spring and fall. And, and most commercial beekeepers at least um, do that very thing. And that's where the problem lies is because commercial beekeepers who have historically been able to just purchase this these antibiotics from equipment supply companies now no longer are able to do that and have to negotiate that prescription with vets, hence this discussion that we're having today. If the state inspectors inspect your colonies and find American fowl brood in those colonies, they are mandated to burn those colonies. That really is the only way that you could slow or stop the spread of American fowl brood. As David noted, you can also irradiate equipment, but the equipment has to be bee free, obviously. So you, the safest thing to do then would be to, to kill the bees prior to putting the equipment in the irradiation facility. But irradiation is not particularly practical or, or even cost effective for many beekeepers. So it's usually um, prudent for them to just burn the colonies. But if the fowl brood infestation is bad enough, clearly they could lose a lot of colonies, which are highly valued these days, $300 plus a colony, uh, and then they get very little compensation in return for burning those colonies. So antibiotic uses is, is really an important tool for beekeepers who are trying to stay ahead of American fowl brood. If you would like to contact me to discuss this further, I'm, I'm leaving now my email address on the slide as we transition uh, back to Mary, who I believe is going to open it up for a Q&A session. Thanks, Jamie. So we do have time now for some questions, if anyone has any follow-up questions to ask our speakers. We do have one question or comment so far. The comment for our speakers is, as veterinarians, we are taught that spore-producing bacteria, like American fall brood and anthrax, should be limed and buried. Burning the spores doesn't destroy the spores, only disseminates them. 
So all that I can say to that comment, it has been common recommended practice for really for the last 50 years to eliminate American foul brew through burning of colonies. So that's really, I guess, more of a question for David Westervelt, whose, whose office is responsible for um, eradication of American foul brew when they, when they find this particular um, disease in a colony. Correct. And to understand that question, actually, yes, we do require the burying of the incinerated parts of the hive. Uh, Yes, it does destroy or kill the spore, but what happens is a lot of times when they're burning the hive, you actually have the honey ooze out and it doesn't reach a temperature high enough that 750 or above to kill the spores. So that has always been the problem with uh, American foul brood, and we don't want bees to come back and rob that back out, carrying it to the hives. But it's still generally the recommendation that right. colony be burned, right, burned. David? Correct. Mm -hmm. So it looks like that's all we have for questions today. Um, so I'd like to thank all of our three presenters for sharing their time with us today, and I'd also like to thank all of you, our participants, for joining in as well. Um, this subject that we've been talking about today is, is an issue that may require a lot of work and collaboration moving forward between beekeepers and veterinarians and their associated agencies as well. Um, so moving forward, feel free to reach out to any of today's presenters with any concerns or questions that you may have. And on behalf of the University of Florida Honeybee Research and Extension Lab, thank you for your participation today.